I am Jeffrey Villardwin, known also as Jeffrey Ironfist in World of Tanks, but here I'm more of a Jeffrey Bronze Fist because we're in the Bronze Age. Uh, this is a jump into the far distant past by Creative Assembly, uh, and we're in the Bronze Age. At the time before Bronze Age collapsed, a time that was known to the ancients as the Golden Age. So they saw it as the Golden Age and the time of the Trojan War, the time that immediately followed the Trojan War, presumably was the Iron Age. And then there followed uh, an Age of Darkness, where writing for a while disappeared and um, there was a vast uh, effect of various phys physical disasters and wars and so on, civilization collapsed. There's an interesting book called um, The Year Civilization Collapsed, 1177. So you may want to read it. And uh, the author said uh, this should have been revised to something closer to 1180 or 1182. Also, following more recent uh, research and dating, but it's it's just the year where the biggest change occurred. But of course, it didn't occur just all that year. The year of the Trojan War was supposed to be at 1182, so it certainly happened at a very pivotal point in um, the history of civilization. And um, so I am going to go through this campaign compared with the previous saga title. Here is the Age of Bronze. And I'm going to show you some examples while I'm talking from uh, the Sparta campaign or the Menelaus campaign, which I have started. I have already started this campaign, so I'm going to go back and load one of the saves. And then, uh, sorry, I have to go back to Helen of Troy. And then I will discuss um, the four, five, the five tips I want to uh, give you for today. So let's go back because I want to go back to a previous save. So let's go load. I want to go back to my earlier save, which was I think it's part of 47. I started two campaigns. Hopefully it's the same campaign. It's just so it's trying different things. Okay. And then. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you five things that I think are important. And, you know, sometimes um, there were videos at the beginning, of several times now, there are YouTube video clips, and people say, oh, this is some essential tips, five tips of this, whatever, introduction, how you play, which factions, and so on. And nearly always, they haven't started a campaign when they give this advice. And the other thing is, when they start a campaign, and this is... Um, uh, this is my first tip. When you when they start a campaign, just look on the on the YouTube videos. Look at campaigns people have started. Never finish. They never finish a campaign. So if you played the previous saga title, Thrones of Britannia, where you could end finish a short campaign in four hours, you could finish it in a day. This is this saga title is more like playing a full campaign on um, uh, a major title like Medieval 2, Total War. It's going to take you several days, possibly weeks, if not more. Um, so depending on how much you play. So um, this is my first tip. So don't go into this game thinking or you can finish it in an evening as with uh, um, Thrones of Britannia. Uh, this is a kind of, I think it's an important tip that you don't hear much. But if you check around on, on YouTube, you will not find a finished campaign. They just take so long. Um, so um, there are two kinds of campaign. One is a Homeric victory, slightly shorter, and then it's a kind of full Total War campaign of victory that's longer. But even the Homeric victory is not short unless you really, really focus. But still, it's going to take a couple of days. A couple of days. That's right. I expect. Um, so that's my first tip, and uh, so for those of you who maybe are not too familiar, maybe I should go through the interface here. So this is where, in the Bronze Age, so these are the sort of factions that you tend to have around you. So Ithaca is here with Odysseus and Achilles is in the north part of this area. 
and uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus further down. You can potentially expand further north in these other areas, which are not highlighted because there are no known heroes and known factions at uh, this point in, in time in my campaign. Um, and uh, here are some of the things. First of all, you have several different resources. So you can have grain, or you can have wood, stone, bronze, or gold. And all these resources are interchangeable. And you can barter them with another faction. And sometimes you can get a good barter. That means depending on what the faction needs and what the faction has, you get perhaps a better price if you look around. You get what I mean. Um, and so, um, so it's not too important which of those you have most abandoned, except that you must have something in the bank in case something happens and things go awry. So you have something to spend to get what you want in times of crisis. So there's an event, some catastrophe, or there's an invasion, something, you may need some money. So don't just burn everything you have. You have to keep something in the bank. Okay, so that's the first tip. It's not an official tip, but have it in mind. Then uh, some of the things you have is Royal Decrees, which are basically the tech tree. So you can select various things in the tech tree. Uh, various, you know, for example, you have gold, treasure holds, gold. This is like you start researching gold, and then you can, if you go the next step, Cadence Drill of 8%, plus 8% to battle speed of all units. So you go a little bit step further. Step further, plus five percent of campaign movement of range of all armies, and you, know, you have also grain, wood, stone, and bronze that give you various different benefits. I find gold is the one, the most general one that uh, applies to all units or all campaign. The other ones are more specific to certain buildings and certain whatever. Okay, so I think gold is a little bit better than the others. So that's my personal opinion. Then here you have, uh, you have the various diplomatic. State, the state of the, with the various diplomatic or diplomatic states with the various factions. And I'm going to go into that later because it's one of my tips, so I won't go into that right now. Then you have religion. Um, this is very interesting. You have you can have various cults, okay? And you can make prayers to these cults. If you make a prayer, you see there, you get, for example, you make a prayer to Hera, you get siege hold out time, whatever. If you make a prayer to Athena, okay, you can't. You say make a prayer to Ares, you get minus 5% to morale of all enemy units and so on. I already made a prayer to Athena in previous turn or something, so I don't have the option to do it again. All right, and then if you have a particular goddess or god selector, then gives you these benefits. You see on the link under the word Athena, it gives you various benefits to your faction, depending of whether you're level one, or tier one, tier two, or tier three. Okay, uh, I won't go into, I, I'll discuss that briefly in another one of my tips further down, so wait there, uh, hang, hang in there. Then, my last guess is things called Call of Arms, it's a particular mechanic, you can hire units from other factions, but it takes two game turns for them to be hired, and you cannot move while hiring those units, so it's not a good idea unless you don't really know you don't have to move, but because you generally only have one or two armies in the first 50 game turns, not being able to move while recruiting those units is going to be a big handicap. And then finally, there's another mechanic. Sometimes you get to colonize some available settlements, but these are only for Sparta, these last two. Other factions have other mechanics. Then over here you have, what is it? Is this the menu? Okay, not important. Over here you have some interesting ones here. The characters, it's one of them. Well, there's, you yeah, can click on them, find various things here. The, all the provinces on the top are the ones you own, settlements you own, the other ones are the other ones here. All the known factions in this one. Uh, here you have various missions that remain. Uh, this is an important uh, control here. It tells you what you haven't done yet. You haven't moved a particular agent, uh, you haven't garrison, you have garrison hero, you haven't moved him, and various things. So you can check here which hero is it, and then you can go click this hero, and then you find that you have a hero there you haven't moved. Okay. So it's a useful thing before the end of turn to check this 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 button here down at the bottom. So these are the main controls. So let's go over to my second tip. So the first one was do not expect to finish the campaign in one evening. The second one um, is the difficulty levels. Now, for those of you who have played um, Total War games, I've been playing them for about 10 years now. Um, difficulty levels 
uh, in the early games were you know the easy difficulties were not very difficult because the campaign and battle AI were not as sophisticated as they are in our in our time. Obviously, since then, I, you know, programming, you know, technology and knowledge into games and AI sort of thing, knowledge has developed so much um, that by now we're at a point where I feel the AI is really becoming challenging, both at the campaign level, which was, you know, just a, a pushover before, but also the battle, or the battle AI is becoming better. Uh, the campaign AI previously up to about Rome two dollar war, I felt it was hopeless. And even uh, the saga, first saga title, uh, Thrones of Britannia, I didn't think the AI was particularly good. But here, the campaign AI is very, very good. I feel. And just check again the campaigns that people have posted that they haven't been able to finish because presumably they started them on hard difficulty or even veteran difficulty. It's called ve very hard. It's called veteran difficulty for those of us who've been around for a long time. And they sort of thought, oh, yeah, it's another total world title. Yeah, no problem. I play at uh, very hard difficulty. And it's, it's, it's very hard, the very hard difficulty, even for me. And hard difficulty is reasonably hard, even for me. And so if you're a new player, don't jump straight to those difficulties. And even if you're an experienced player, just play a little bit on normal difficulty before you jump onto hard difficulty. Hard difficulty is going to drain your art. Just watch some of the um, campaign gameplays that are there. People, you know, you can tell from the voices, they're totally drained out from the difficulty of these of the, of the campaign uh, in this in this total war series so um the difficult levels are what they say they are and that's fair i mean you know you play napoleon or whatever and you play france as napoleon you know not each one of us is napoleon you know there were not very many napoleons in the world history <laughs> i mean you don't conquer the world so easily if you're not Napoleon and even he couldn't do it, you know, and you f you feel it in this campaign. You really feel it in this Total War uh, title. Okay, so that's my next tip. So don't overreach yourself. Um, now, <clears throat> the third uh, tip is related somewhat you have the option to go for a uh, total war versus just going for a homeric uh, victory or something it's somewhere somewhere here objectives you go for a homeric victory or total war victory total war victory is a little bit harder and you know that sort of thing so it's like a short campaign a homeric victory but it's also more tied to the story of the iliad uh having said that um it's um, it's also part of the theme, and that's my third tip. You, if you're one of the Achaean factions, you are a natural ally of your other Achaeans. So if you backstab, if you backstab another Achaean faction, whether ally or neutral early in the campaign, that's the end of your campaign. I'm sorry to say, if you made that mistake, that's quite clearly the end of your campaign. You're going to have an awful time from then on. If you attack a neutral or kind of friendly-ish Achaean faction, being yourself an Achaean, I mean, you just ruined everything, you know, just start all over again. You're going to waste your time. You're going to be incredibly frustrated. You're not going to achieve anything anymore. So you're, the Achaeans are your natural allies. You must never, never, ever... Even if the eye tells you attack that Achaean faction, whatever, don't attack an Achaean faction. Don't attack an Achaean faction. You, you, you're going to be an enemy of everyone from then on, and right from the start of your campaign. Don't do that. Okay. So, um, so there is a Homeric story. Just you know, everyone knows who the Iliad, what the story of the Iliad is. I mean, it's um, almost like you know, as well known as whatever the Bible. I don't know. Maybe it's even better known than the Bible. And so, uh, you know, the Achaeans campaigned together against the Trojans 
don't start a war against other Achaeans. <laughs> Just don't do it. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, they are your natural allies. Otherwise, you won't have any allies in your campaign. And this is not an easy campaign. Even if you have all the Achaeans as allies, it's not going to be an easy campaign. So I've talked about the campaign. I want to jump a little bit on um, the units. Okay. Um, so the units uh, are interesting, very diverse, although there isn't cavalry, but that's actually quite good, I think, in my opinion, there's no cavalry. Because cavalry are very often, you know, is set up in such a way in most uh, Total War series titles that it can be OP. At least it wasn't the case of Medieval 2, it was very OP. And so you have just an army of just cavalry. It wasn't particularly expensive to have some light cavalry or horse archers or something. Even horse archers were cheap and you could overwhelm all your enemies, whatever. And they could never catch you, catch you whatever. I mean, you were just extremely powerful. In this game, uh, there's very little cavalry. And what cavalry there is, which is chariots mainly, but not entirely, but mostly, um, it's, in, it's very expensive, it's only small numbers of chariots, and it's kind of okay, but it's not, you're not going to route a unit just by charging it with chariots. I mean, it's not going to happen. Um, you have to route to attack it again, and then charge it again, then charge it again, and then maybe if it's a weak unit, you route it, and it's going to take you forever. So basically, there is no OP unit. And the other thing that I need to say is that not only is there no OP unit, um, but uh, you start with it, basically you have enough money to start with a single army. So I'm going to show you my army, by the way. You can have more armies, but mainly you have one main army, so it's here. And basically you have this one army and you're going to go on campaign eventually, game turn 47. I've started my campaign towards Troy, which is up here. You see all this area has not been discovered yet. Uh, Pilus got here first before me and I managed to get there first somehow and then I'm second and even some of these areas have not been I mean this the coast of Asia is completely unknown we have discovered that Lesbos is controlled by uh, the Trojans of Hector here we have the Trojans of Hector here we have the Trojans of Paris Paris of Troy and so this sort of area northwards is controlled by the Trojans and they have also various allies here and they have some allies also further south and here are some the Amazons and so on so this area is all hostile and all this hostile area that has natural allies which at this point they are allied against me let's go to the diplomacy thing so you can see what's going on so diplomacy you can see uh, I have various this this symbol here is, is alliance, military alliance. So I'm allied with Salamis, with Mycenae, Thea, and so on. Thea is Achilles and various other factions. And these are all Achaeans. And I'm an enemy of all the allies of Troy here. Here they are, they're all in red. And these are the factions. They also have some not very friendly factions in various places, like the Thessalians, the Aeolians. In various other factions that I would discover, the Lydians and various other factions in Asia are not very friendly. But from about here northward are the, Tro the Trojans and their allies, and they are all extremely hostile. Not only that, they're all allied with each other. So you can see here, we as the uh, Danaans, as the Achaeans, have Hector of Troy as an enemy. We have Troy, another faction. We have Dardania, an ally of the Trojans. We have Paris of Troy as an enemy, and Ilion in Brussels as an enemy. And at this point, I only have two of them as, as enemies myself, but all the other factions have all of them. So uh, uh, Salamis, Mycenae, and the other Achaean okay, factions have all of them. I uh, haven't gone to war with all of them yet. And that's another point. You know, in the previous campaign, I started the first time doing, doing Sparta. They all had all those heroes, all those enemies, very game turn 20 or so, and they asked me to ally with them. So I thought, okay, I'll ally. I had all those enemies. Suddenly, for some reason, I didn't realize 
how they all made peace with all of them and i was left alone being an enemy just on my own of all these alliances trojan alliances suddenly there were all these trojan armies appearing down here in Sparta and so on and no you know my allies are all going to peace with them <laughs> i was left on my own uh high and dry so be careful always check what your allies are allied against because they may make suddenly peace with all of them but at the moment in any case we're all allied against these common enemies and they're all allied with each other if you click onto them you see they all allied with each other it's this one here military access partners non-aggression partners alliance yeah they're kind of all in the same cahoot yeah and so if you end up here with one army, which probably by came to 40, 50, maybe you only have one decent army like I do here with uh, whatever it is. Okay, sorry, let's sleep. What is about 20 units, yeah. So I have a full army, but you, know, can, you can't afford much more than a full army. And you're up here, and if you realize all these factions, the AI factions have one to two armies each, full stacks, and if you play a hard difficulty, possibly more and they have strong garrisons in the cities each of them is the equivalent of at least half stack if not more and then you know every wherever you go to attack the AI is clever and moves quickly you cannot do it on your own you just cannot so the first time when I attack one of the settlements thing was this one I put um, put one of these, what they're called, war coordination targets on it for all my allies. So I clicked on it and then I clicked here and then you could put a war coordination target on a settlement. For example, this one. Okay, where's it gone? Okay. War. Am I? Okay, I'm not at war with Paris at the moment. Okay, but you can put it here, for example. And then then it appears next to it and says Hector of Troy, who have a coordination target, Bront Haldos with this place. Okay, so then everyone hopefully will come and help you out. Now, what is the problem here? Uh, this is somewhat, you know, an interesting thing to say, although it's not one of my official points that I want to discuss. Um, what's the problem here? Um, if you go to a subsequent I guess it's a sixth tip. So, so I have a six tips rather than five as I was intended. If you go, let's go to another, uh, another save, save load. Let's go to following save one. Maybe it's 47 now. Let's go to, oh no, let's go to something that's not, maybe. The same will not be 52 or 49. Let's see. Make it as it goes. I want to discuss the uh, mythical units. But yeah, maybe this is good enough. Don't know. I mean, you see a couple of armies and agents have appeared. Here is. Odysseus, here's again Odysseus. Uh, Mycenae has conquered the settlement that was previously controlled by the Trojans. And this settlement has been captured by Pylos. And various other armies are setting over this, what is that? Seaborn, what faction is this? Ithaca, so it's Odysseus. So you see, the other Achaeans are sending all over armies. And at this part, of the campaign because the war with the Trojans was just started. Everyone had been building up their economies for 15 ga 50 game turns. Uh, and so everyone, uh, lots of cash floating, floating around. So let's have another look at the money people have. Let's see, let's look around for some of my allies. Okay, oh, this is Ajax. So you see you have 12, Thousand grains, seven, eight thousand wood, four thousand eighty army, mean, plenty of stuff. Later on in the campaign, all this dried up, and they were like nearly all of them bankrupted. And so, what's going on here then is that at this early point, because they all had been saving up and building up their economies so far, 
they all had lots of money, so they all sent off armies. So suddenly I had all these allies floating around. I thought, okay, I'm not on my own. Yeah. So now I can attack them and I can put a coordination target here and then everyone will come to help me. And they did because this was even an empty settlement, just had a small garrison. So everyone came to help me. Everyone came to help me. Yeah. This has 15 units. Okay, it's a bit harder, but we have more than 50 units around here. And this has 8 units, it has 12 units, it has 7 units, but all of them together and the ones that are coming, they were not, you know, the worst uh, the worst case scenario, this has 7 units, which is it's about half strength of this one, and this has 8 units. But this has 12, it's almost equal strength. So the AI tells them, yeah, go and attack, so they come and help me. However, later on in the campaign, I'm going to show you a following save, and uh, you'll see what is going on later on this in the campaign very soon you know, doesn't game turns later their cash dried up their economies dried up once they fought a few battles and you know they went to war for a few game turns their economy dried up i'll just go to whatever some of the more recent ones game turn 70. that's in the sexy uh mythical warrior you can have. Somehow you can hire some of these uh, warriors you see there on the left. But you can only hire a few at a time, so that's another tip. I won't go into it, but be careful. When you hire one of these mythical warriors, hire them at the right exact moment, because you're only going to have them for a few game turns, and you won't be able to have them again for dozens of turns, and you're only limited the number of these mythical warriors you can have during the campaign. So be very careful when you hire one of them. So here now we are in this um, in this later stage in the campaign. First of all, check you know now we know the Trojan armies that like there like enemy armies everywhere, and whatever you have like four units here and four units there have dried up. I mean there's no support and there are enemy armies everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. You know wherever you look at enemy armies, enemy armies, and you cannot do it on your own anymore. And I'll show you what the problem is. I've already hinted at it. Let's go back to Salamis. Okay, maybe I'm wrong about Salamis, but some of them, let's go to Mycenae. I mean, we're in full-fledged war. Mycenae was one of the wealthiest factions to start with. Now they run out of copper. They only have 8,000 food. Thea has even less than 5,000. No copper, almost no wood, almost no gold very little, so almost no copper, very little wood. Uh, no copper at all, not all, what I'm saying. And let's look at the other factions. I mean, this have a little bit of food, but no, no, very little gold, very little stone. Argus, things even worse, yeah. Uh, and are, are there allies? Where are some other allies? They're all like that. Pylos was completely, almost completely bankrupt. They have some gold because they produce gold in their land, but no copper, no stone, uh, very little grain and so on. So they all bankrupted themselves at the start of the war with the Trojans, and now they have no armies to send. So they send these tiny armies, like four units here and six units there or something. This is one of my armies, it has seven units, it's pretty good. <laughs> and these are my two main arms at this point, with 18 units respectively. And there's one stuck here sitting around with Achilles, 40 units, but all the other ones are small. And the other problem that happens, that I said, I, I, I want to discuss later, about the gods. And this is my last point. There is no best god. I mean, sometimes you, you'd hear in the very initial uh, video clips that have become very popular, YouTube kind of you know, presentations, you know, the new campaign advice to new players and all that, you know, no special god for, you know, whatever. All gods have their merits and things like that. It's not clear what that means. What it means is that in every situation, there's one particular god that's going to help you. But next game turn or next time you do something else, it's going to be a different god that you wish you had pray to. And you can only pray, you can only have like four or five active, play, active prayers at any time. And you cannot have more than a couple of cots going, really. So it's a bit of a problem. So here, what has happened? What is happening? What another problem? They don't just have run out of cash, but they haven't prayed to Poseidon because you know the AI presumably doesn't know to do. You cannot do it, but you only can, you can only have like one temple per major settlement and things like that. So you're limited. 
And so these people have not prayed to Poseidon. Potentially, they don't have a settlement with a temple uh, dedicated to Poseidon. So they're already suffering sea attrition. Because you have to give a prayer to Poseidon and have the prayer granted before you sail. Otherwise, as it happened in real history, um, there will be no wind and you will be stranded out at sea without food and so on. So you suffer attrition. Um, and you cannot sail across. And you sail across, okay, in some way, but yeah, you know, suffering heavy casualties from attrition. Um, so, whatever armies they arrive, I mean, this have this has thirteen units in it, but mm, some of them are suffering attrition on the way over. And then what is going to happen is now they know the strength of the garrisons, and you go here. And this, this not only has its own garrison of 13 units, you see here, 15 units, sorry, but in addition, there's an army in it of 20 units. So there are 33 units in this particular settlement. So if you sail here with, uh, with this 15 unit, you, even this one unit, 15, this stack with 15 units, you, you, you know, if you put a coordination target here, he thinks, okay, I have 15, Units, he has 33. I'm going to just get my uh, my rear, my butt kicked if I attack. So they, what they do is they just sail around randomly. One sails here, one sails there, suffering more attrition at sea, not going anywhere. I mean, a couple of guys have landed here. They just landed, you see. But most of the time, they're just sailing around at sea, suffering attrition from being at sea. And the units that finally arrive are these little worn out kind of small stacks that all they could afford to send. And um, then they all think, oh, I cannot attack. I only have like four units or eight units or whatever. I cannot attack a settlement of 33 units. So even if I put a coordination target here, they will not come and help me. So basically these other units now, after the initial attack, are just hanging around and just you know, it's, they're good as distraction. They distract the enemy. So it feels like, hmm, you know, maybe we should keep some units here just in case they land or something. Of course. So the AI thinks carefully about that and don't, don't draw all the units out to attack me. So it's good to have them as distract, distracting kind of elements. But they're not going to come to help me if I decide to attack. They will not come to help me. They only came once at the very beginning. And so I'm just left on my own. Now I've sent two units here. I've left all this other area open. Fortunately, I managed to get a third general just in time. So I have a third general there, not a very strong one. But I have both my units here because here there are four plus 15, 19 units. So if I attack with 18, just a single stack, they'll be, they will be, they have, they will have stronger strength. They won't be able to attack them with a single stack. So I had to bring two stacks. That's how it is. And um, you, the, so the, the last point is that you're very, you're basically on your own. Once you're here, you're going to be doing all the fighting from now on. You're on your own. If you can't hold your own, don't come. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. You know, it's okay to take an island maybe. It's a little bit protected. Fingers crossed. But once, or is some areas here I've captured, where is it? There's an area here that I've captured that's far away from Troy, which is also far away from Lydia, which is another potential enemy down there. And next to me, I have some weak factions. So just, and they have a buffer faction here. So just by luck, I took those factions from Paris of Troy, which are well protected. They are sort of on an island with another faction as a buffer and some weak neutral factions next to them. But if you venture towards Troy, over here, it's a wasp nest. I mean, the armies everywhere, they just keep appearing from, you know, the armies here, the armies there, the more armies, and more armies, and you don't know, suddenly an army appears from here and an army appears from somewhere else, like from down here, like this guy, for example, and I have an unprotected settlement there. You like you're surrounded by fifteen armies, and you have two and a half of your own plus some guys stranded out at sea, you know, just wondering what to do. You know, that's what it is. And if 
if the AI was a little bit more coordinated, you'd be wiped out in, in a flash. I'm playing on hard difficulty, not veteran difficulty in this campaign. So, um, so don't overreach yourself. And the other thing that I was mentioning is there's no, there's no best guard for all occasions. There's no best guard for one faction. Like for example, uh, Apollo is good for archers kind of thing. Yeah, units, factions that have archers, but you know, all armies have archers because you don't know what to expect. So I need to have some missile units too. You know, maybe I'll, you know, whatever. May you know, I may I don't want to be like overrun by some strong armies that have lots of missile units. And, you know, maybe start skirmishing around, being something. So I had to bring some skirmishing units as well. So these armies have skirmishes. But then also you have some spear units just in case you know uh, they attack in great force and I need to hold the line. Then I also have to have some lighter units to flank around. I want to have a heavy unit to protect my general. Um, as a bodyguard, because he doesn't have a bodyguard. And I don't know what to expect. I don't know what army will, will attack me. But these armies are also very versatile. So you end up having just a kind of versatile force of several units, different kinds. And it's not like, you know, Athena is good for spearmen, but you're not going to be all spearmen. You know, I have a lot of spearmen, but it's not all spearmen. Then uh, Zeus is something for good for axes or clubmen or something. Yeah, maybe uh, here I don't have any clubmen, but maybe I have some clubmen somewhere else. But you know, it's only good for clubmen, supporting clubmen. And Apollo is good for uh, missile units, and Artemis for archers. And, but no, no god is good for all of them except Ares that puts dread on the enemy or something. But then doesn't give you any buffs to your own units. Uh, so unless the ex Axemen, I think, gives some buffs to Axemen. Uh, so with a various, so the, it's, you know, so if you're going to have a varied army, no particular god is going to be a solution to all your goals. And uh, if you have, here's another, you know, suffer attrition, let's see. So, and uh, the other thing is then Aphrodite is good for improving, what is it, let's have a look at one of my settlements. One settlement you get happiness, okay, uh, uh, Aphrodite is good for that, but you can also get growth and a hero is good for growth. And you can also get influence, but some other god, I can't remember Zeus or was it some other god, is good for influence. And so, I mean, you can go for happiness for Aphrodite, but then you won't get growth. You can go for growth for Hera, but then you won't get happiness. And maybe have some settlement that has negative happiness or something like this, and Hera will not help you. So, so no particular god is good is an answer for everything, or is good for one particular faction, or even for one particular time in your campaign. Um, and every time you have to pray to a god, or a different god, or ideally have multiple main settlements, like at least maybe two or three, with different temples to different gods per settlement. So you can appease various gods. And then there are some buildings that appease Jews. And so you really have to kind of think very uh, carefully. There's no, it's not just there's no particular god for a particular faction or for a particular unit in your army. And your arms are going to be very diverse because you don't know what to expect. But in addition, there is no particular god for every situation. Like Zeus provides diplomatic bonus, for example. Um, like Hera provides more, whatever it was, uh, growth or something, or happiness, or you know, whatever. I can't remember nothing. Let's have a look at them. So Aphrodite provides more growth and happiness. Ah, sorry, Hera provides production. Sits hold down time attrition somewhere. Recruitment cost and minus one construction time for main buildings and construction costs and growth. That's right. And then the other ones have other benefits. Areas for, let's say, what is it? What was it? Uh, raiding, looting, and sacking, for example. Zeus for diplomatic uh, bonuses. Poseidon, lower attrition when you're at sea. And Athena, uh, various battle effects, melee attack or defense, and so on. Um, so, 
it's one of them has its own merits and its own situation where they're useful. And you you have to be alternating, using them, using them all basically throughout your campaign, and, you know, and praying to one or the other as the situation arises. So these were my five or six tips for today. Thank you for watching.